You're a snacker. You wish you weren't, but you just can't help yourself. Every couple of hours, you find yourself raiding the fridge looking for something to eat. And you're hungry for nice things. The sweeter and more fattening, the better. Now, when it comes to dealing with your snacking habit, health gurus will look you up and down like something the cat dragged in and admonish you to just stop snacking. Hello, you would if you could. You end up feeling ashamed, angry, frustrated, defeated. What if I told you it really isn't directly your fault? The decision to eat is determined by social, psychological, and physiological factors. And attempts to fix the problem typically focus on psychology. You can persuade yourself not to snack in the short term, but it's hard because psychology is seldom the dominant factor. Physiological factors are. And one physiological factor that can spark a feeding frenzy is a glucose dip. Join us for this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we dip into sugar dips and carb cravings. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster, helping you battle sugar gremlins, heifer lumps, and other health horribles through better body chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. Now, the idea of glucose dips is not new, and colloquially, it's often blamed for calorie indiscretions. But its physiological existence in ordinary people has been questioned. Having said that, anyone taking insulin as a therapy will know the horrendous feelings that go hand in hand with a glucose crash. The official signs and symptoms include dizziness, tremor, sweating, heart palpitations, personality changes, which is a nice way of saying you become grumpy and aggressive, confusion, and bizarre behavior. I once saw my dad polish off the skin of an avocado. In the case of someone experiencing an insulin overdose, if they don't get glucose into their system fast, Loss of consciousness follows. Think diabetic coma. Of course, this response is not normal. It's a drug-induced adverse effect. And the reason it plays out is because the normal physiological responses have been overridden by the exogenous insulin. But truth be told, too much endogenous insulin can trigger a similar response. Now collapsing in a heap on the floor won't happen. The brain will dispatch a rescue team. And it's only the tail end of that emergency response that brings on the autonomic meltdown described earlier. Long before this happens, the brain has already instituted damage control. And one of the things it does is it tells you to get something to eat. Now, on paper, the something could be anything. An apple, a handful of nuts, a piece of cheese. Unfortunately, most of the time, the snack will be something full of carbs. Okay? A sugar gremlin moment. The official scientific name for the snack attack is a subclinical reactive hypoglycemia. It's subclinical because it actually flies under the radar. You don't know it is happening on a conscious level, but it is still real. And it's connected with the snacking habits. And for the most part, it's not really talked about. When it comes to tracking glucose levels, the focus is always on what happens in the first two hours after a meal. And when glucose levels are too high, alarm bells sound. And when they're high enough, your doctor calls for pharmacological help. Since glucose dips are unlikely to happen inside of that two-hour window, they typically happen somewhere around the three-hour mark. So using random finger pricks, it's pretty unlikely that hyperglycemic events will be picked up. The measurement is a moment in time, and selecting the moment is like picking the winning lotto numbers. 
But thanks to technology, the ability to track glucose beyond the two-hour mark is becoming routine. And continuous glucose monitoring devices can and do pick up glucose dips on a routine basis. This is what a team of Japanese researchers discovered when they tracked glucose levels in non-diabetic males aged between 50 and 65 years. They found that 50% of them experienced blood glucose levels below 70 milligrams per deciliter. This would be 3.9 millimolars and the threshold for hyperglycemia during the 24 hours after an oral glucose tolerance test. And for a quarter of them, the time in the hyperglycemic range was more than 55 minutes. That's a significant amount of time. And it does have consequences on appetite and meal frequency. A paper by a British team did a good job capturing this when they analyzed the postprandial glucose, appetite and energy intake in 1,070 UK participants following an oral glucose tolerance test and a variety of standardized meals. The team looked for and quantified any glucose dips happening in that two to three hour mark. Based on their average glucose dip, the individuals were dropped into one of four buckets. Now, the relatively big sample size allowed them to see patterns across the quartiles and the big dippers definitely got the munchies. They felt hungrier and, well, they did something about it. They ate their next meal sooner and they ate a little bit more. In a 24-hour period, they ended up consuming more calories. Not a lot more, but a few extra calories day in and day out as a habit of showing up and those extra pounds can become a health risk. So the question is, why is it happening? Well, it's speculated that it has something to do with glucose effectiveness. This is the uptake of glucose that happens independent of insulin. You see, insulin is only important for specific cell types. Thanks to biology, some folks are a lot better at using glucose and inhibiting the production of glucose by the liver. For the record, the glucose effectiveness number can be estimated using data collected from an oral glucose tolerance test. It's a doozy of a calculation. This paper will walk you through it. I'll link to it in the description below if you want to take a read. When you're out and out diabetic, you suck at it. But before you get there, you might actually be very good at it. Too good. Your superpower creates a vulnerability as your brain works super hard to protect you from those potentially life-threatening glucose crashes, you spend your days grazing and you get caught on the sugar gremlin roller coaster because snacking begets snacking. So what can you do about it? Well, telling you to snack less just creates negative emotions. It's not a choice. It's a necessity. What you need to do is snack differently. If we review the science, meal initiation is triggered by a fall in blood glucose and terminated by a rise in it. A somewhat simplistic way of looking at this is insulin is the hormone that drops glucose and glucagon is the hormone that increases glucose. It's a team effort. And both sides of the equation can be managed. In the case of glucagon, we can draw from the experiences of type 1 diabetics. When they experience a clinical hypoglycemic event, the pharmacological solution to the problem is a glucagon shot. Now it turns out that you can mimic a glucagon shot by including a small amount of protein in your meal. In the case of insulin, its release is primarily triggered by eating carbs. So you want to cut your carbs. Now the goal is not necessary to go zero carb. Just keep the number within a range your body can handle. 
and for most people this is somewhere around 20 to 30 grams of carbs in one sitting. I call this obeying the rule of thirds. Include a little carbs, a little protein, and a little fat every time you eat. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. And if you're metabolically challenged, this is the place to start. It's the central premise of the Candy Floss system. You can learn more about it in our free Willpower Report. Begin the journey today to better body chemistry and better health. Visit the Better Body Chemistry blog for tips and resources to help you. The advice is simple to follow and based on real science, not hype. Here's a reference to the Japanese papers. To view the other papers mentioned, click through to the blog post. Know someone who is a prodigious snacker. Share this video with them so they understand how their eating habits are the reason they've always got their fingers in the cookie jar. If it's not a willpower problem, it's biology. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.